Hi and welcome back. In my last episode, our journey started and ended here in Sweden. And in this episode, we shall stay here up in the cold north. However, with a completely different topic. We are going to visit an archaeological excavation that showed to have a surprising link to the Roman Empire. I would like to direct a special thanks to the Department of Archaeology at Uppsala University and their branch on Gotland. For great patience with my questioning and for letting me use photographs taken by the professors, archaeologists and students in situ. I am your host Morten Eriksson. Welcome to Ancient History. For several years since 2019, archaeologists have been digging in Butler in central parts of the island of Gotland in the Baltic Sea. Butler hosts a large number of settlement remains from throughout the Iron Age, with traces and finds of housing, graves, human activity and cultural landscapes. The Nordic Iron Age covers about 1500 years, so it is a rather long period. It is mainly divided into the older and younger Iron Age, respectively. The splitting point is at the end of the Roman Empire, or in about 550 CE. The age itself ends with the closure of the Viking Age in about 1066 and the battle at Stamford Bridge. In summer 2021, the excavation team, including students from Uppsala University, unearthed what would show to be a most extraordinary find. In the dirt, they came upon a grave. Its main features were two beautiful stone circles. At first glance, perhaps it didn't differ much from other Iron Age graves in Sweden. However, in its centre, the archaeologists soon came upon a stone lid made from granite. It measured some 290 centimetres in length and 110 centimetres in width. And sometime during the past millennia, it had broken into eight major pieces and caved in. In the dirt layers beneath it was soon uncovered something, or rather someone, magnificent. A male skeleton of what appeared to be a warrior or a person of statue. He was buried with few grave goods, but among them a very distinct sword. It is an extraordinary find. In most of our Iron Age graves, any significant human remains are rarely found, but this man was clearly well preserved. We can see the stone circle grave in this picture with the remains of the butler warrior in its centre. He was buried on his side and he embraces the sword as if it was his most precious belonging. The sword points downward, having its pommel close to the man's chest and head. The man seems to have been just short of 180 centimetres tall in life. And it is estimated that these are the remains of a man that were in his upper thirties or about thirty-five to forty years old at his death. He had, among other afflictions, clear signs of osteoarthritis in his upper body. The grave has been scanned with modern technology and in this fantastic 3D rendition of the results we can see the full layout of the grave and its late inhabitant. There were, however, further grave goods in the grave. Among them, a knife, corroded and in bad, almost unintelligible state after spending thousands of years in the ground. An urn of black stoneware placed above his head. Three pearls, one each made of amber, glass and a fossil. But more specifically, also two distinct spurs that is believed to have been attached to his shoes and feet when he was laid to rest. Now, the most intriguing fact about the sword is that it is not of Germanic origin, but Roman. The spurs, on the other hand, are of a Germanic sort. The question arises, how did they end up in a Nordic grave? Where are they from? And what can this tell us about Germanic and Roman history? And how has the find been dated? Let us start with the problem of acquisition. So how did a Roman sword, and the spurs for that matter, end up in the possession of a warrior in the far north. There are, of course, endless possibilities, but as far as I can see, there are three explanations that are more likely to be true than any other, taken together or separately. The easiest one is, of course, trade. 
there was a widespread trade also with weapons with the regions outside the Roman Empire. And there was, of course, also extensive trade being made between the different peoples and the tribes that was not part of the empire. The warrior or someone else could simply had picked the sword up while visiting some trade settlement in the Baltic or along the North Sea coast. What speaks against this solution is the fact that the man was buried together with the weapons, and not the least with the spurs, as if they were of special value to him. Hence, there are two other explanations that are perhaps even more probable. One is service in the Roman army as an auxiliary cavalry man. This theory was early promoted by the excavation team. The use of not the least Germanic mercenaries accompanying the legions had been widespread ever since the time of Julius Caesar and was a growing phenomenon during the first century. In the second century, the number of so-called auxilia were actually larger than the number of legionaries. Therefore, this could be a grave of a warrior and his memories from serving in the Roman army as a cavalry man. Maybe he served along the Limes, maybe in Britain. However, there is a problem with this interpretation. The vast majority of Axelia were recruited from peoples living inside the empire, but that were not Roman citizens. The Batavians, being one such people, renowned for their auxiliary troops. Although not unheard of, recruiting outside the Limas was scarce and was in any case made primarily from tribes living close to the border and being in alliance with Rome. For a warrior from distant shores travelling through enemy land to serve in the Roman army and then travelling back again seemed unlikely to me. Adding to this, the term of service in the auxilia was 25 years, which leaves us with an unlikely age for the soldier in the grave to have been able to return home, at least legally. The last explanation might therefore be that he won the sword and the spurs in battle against the Roman army, in the same way that a large number of Germanic men served in the Roman army, a main enemy was the Germanic tribes, as the Gauls had by now all been conquered. As an example, the destruction of the three Roman legions in the Teutoburger forest took place in 9 CE. That battle was the direct result of confrontation with Germanic forces under Arminius. Hence, the sword and the spurs can be spoils of war from any such conflict or incursion in the first centuries. That would mean that our man would have travelled there to join in some kind of conflict. We do not know. But what about the dating? It is time for the conclusion. A more general dating places the grave in what is called the Roman Iron Age. More specifically in this case, somewhere between year 1 and 300 CE. However, some details let us make a slight more precise dating. As for the stoneware, the undecorated surface places it probably somewhere before the end of the 2nd century CE. Making the reign of Marcus Aurelius and Commodus and their extensive struggle against the Germanics in the Marcomanni Wars as the Terminus Ante Qm, that is, the last possible date. The spurs are of a sort called Stuhlsporen in German. Their special shape includes four characteristic rivets and are of non-Roman origin. These rivets are commonly present during the first century and gradually disappears from use during the second century. Spurs resembling the ones in the grave have been found in Scotland, Scandinavia, Germany and Western Poland. The spurs in the grave are made of iron and bronze with silver decorations. This leaves us with a sword. It is of a sort and shape called spatha in Latin. This longer type was extensively used by Germanic warriors. It was also popular among Celtic auxiliaries and later became the standard sword for the heavy Roman infantry, replacing the short sword, the famous gladius. Later in time, the spatha would probably make the model for both Viking-era swords and the medieval knight sword. 
The sword in the grave is 80 centimeters long. The length and the scabbard shape, that is, the scabbard's lower end, places the sword roughly between the 1st and the 2nd century. The pommel of the sword is made from ivory. There are also parts of silver decorations. Hence, the weapon seems to be a blade of some statue and quality. Therefore, we seem to be at perhaps in the vicinity of the years 130 to 150 CE in our dating. So what do we make of all this? The truth is, as usual, we do not know what the correct answer is, and it is useless to speculate. But wearing the spurs in the grave, embracing his sword, signals a perceived level of pride and personal attachment in life. No DNA analysis has been made. And speaking with the lead archaeologists, their assessment is that an analysis would bring little to the understanding of the find. For now. In any case, it wouldn't bring anything to the answers we are seeking here. That was all for now, and as always, thank you for all the kind and interesting comments to my videos. See you soon. <laughs>